Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the DLC Drop Podcast. Today, it's my pleasure to welcome Joe McMahon of WaveMaker. He's worked for a number of different esports organizations and is going to share the various approaches that various orgs make in the space that can be the right match for brands. We're also going to go deep into the right types of approaches for brands that effectively engage this community. Join me in talking to Joe. Drop in the untold stories of industry leaders, influencers, and insights on future innovation. I'm John Davidson, and this is the DLC, DLC Drop, Drop Podcast. Podcast. All right, excited for this episode of the DLC Drop Podcast. Joe McMahon, how are you doing today, my friend? Doing well, John. Thank you for having me on. How's it going with you? Uh, it's going pretty well. Uh, Tuesdays are my favorite days because I get to report record podcasts and um it's a lot of fun especially when i get to record with a fellow esports partnership professional like yourself uh because that's my experience and there's a lot of back and forth uh, a lot of sharing uh maybe some of the same ideas and perspectives uh probably some different ones as well so these types of ones are my favorite one to host because i feel like i have something that i can share as well yeah no totally i'm excited to discuss anything and everything Awesome. So uh, tell us, uh, to start out, what is your current role at WaveMaker? And then let's walk through this path of how you got where you are today. Absolutely. So I serve as the a manager on the sports and live team at WaveMaker. We are a department within the larger content division at WaveMaker, uh, primarily a media agency. Uh, but we have our little... There's 13 of us on the sports and live team uh, and growing currently. Uh, we actually just uh, posted some new jobs. But um, I serve as the esports and gaming lead within the sports and live team, helping brands navigate partnerships and sponsorships uh, across gaming and esports. Fantastic. And I know that you have some deeper esports experience uh, with roles at Immortals, at Evil Geniuses. Uh, tell us how you got into those roles and um, your experience there. Uh, yeah, I so I started my career in traditional sports, uh, which is becoming a more common thing in in the gaming industry now. Yeah, um, but uh, I was selling minor league hockey tickets uh, in Allen, Texas, for the Allen Americans. I live uh, right across the street from the Allen Event Center, man. Like I'm there yeah. all the time. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, a great experience there. We won the Kelly Cup championship in my first season there. So nice. got a ring. Felt like, okay, that's the pinnacle of working for a pro sports team, right? So uh, one and done. You know, worked on ticket sales and sponsorships there. Um, obviously, it's a, it's a minor league team in a major league market, uh, yes. being in the DFW Metroplex. So uh, we're not talking massive sponsorship deals, right? But it was still great experience to really cut your teeth and learn how the sports business industry works. Um, and then from there, I ended up at a sponsorship sales agency called Premier Partnerships, mm -hmm. uh, which recently was bought by Playfly uh, Sports. So, uh, But while I was at Premier, we represented all different kinds of sports and entertainment properties, municipalities for... Uh, not only sponsorship sales representation, but uh, we also did strategic valuations and consulting uh, in that regard for structuring different sponsorship programs. So right after I had started there, you know, we had you know, the L.A. Chargers. They, they just moved from San Diego to L.A. They needed some help with some local sponsorships, sales. Uh, we had South Beach and Food Festival, New York Wine and Food Festival the Greek theater out in LA and then the Alamo dome in San Antonio. Um, and what really got me into the esports and gaming world was we were working with allied esports, uh, to yeah. sell sponsorships for their new, at the time, new arena in Las Vegas. HyperX uh, arena Hyper as it's known now. Yeah. HyperX esports. Yeah. So Been there a few times. We worked yeah. on that project. Yeah, it's an awesome venue. Uh, it's crazy how it like used to be a nightclub, and now it's you know one of the premier land centers <laughs> in North America, right? So yeah. we had worked on that project and had some sales success uh, with that client. And small industry world word travels fast, 
And about 18 months after I had been at uh, Premiere, I uh, was given an opportunity to join Immortals on their sponsorship sales team. Nice. And that's when I went, you know, head first into the, into the gaming world, uh, which, you know, growing up, I wasn't like a gamer by trade. I wouldn't say like, sure. you know, played a lot of the sports games and some medal of honor every, every now and then. And, but really it was after college that I got more into gaming, at least for online multiplayer. Cause I would play halo five. That was with, my uh, guess. My college yeah. buddies, Cause we're all over the country and wanted to stay in touch. So, um, you know, had enough knowledge to feel comfortable jumping in full time uh, at Immortals, and then um, it's been, I guess, th- almost three years now. But as you know, as much as anybody in this space, they're kind of like dog years <laughs> in the esports and gaming world because it's so volatile. Everything moves so fast that uh, you learn a lot in that time. The DLC Drop podcast is sponsored by Ice Shaker. I've been a huge fan of this brand for the past few years, ever since I met founder Chris Gronkowski. Uh, What I love about this product is the brand story, the functionality, and the customization. iShaker is a Shark Tank company invested in by Mark Cuban and Alex Rodriguez, owned by NFL players Rob Gronkowski and Chris Gronkowski. I love using my ice shaker anytime I'm driving to the podcast studio, I'm going skateboarding, or I'm at the gym. No matter what I'm doing, it just does a great job of keeping my drinks hot or cold. The customization for ice shaker is something that's super unique. You can get any name, just about any logo engraved onto your ice shaker and delivered to you within just three to five business days. Get your own DLC Drop branded ice shaker at icesaker.com forward slash DLC Drop. Save 20% on all ice shaker products with the discount code DLC Drop. Yeah, and then you jumped over to EG, is that right? Yeah, and then after Immortals, I uh, ended up at Evil Geniuses. Um, same situation there, doing sponsorship sales, strategic partnerships, and um, then very recently or not very recently but uh, about five months ago in september joined wave maker um a bit of a benedict arnold situation where okay. uh, you're on one side of the table selling the sponsorships and then switching over to the buy side so um and uh, you know one of our clients was a client of evil geniuses at the time so <laughs> yeah. it was it was kind of funny to be able to you know hop on status calls with my old co-workers but sure. uh, yeah, so then I've been at Wavemaker since then and been really enjoying it so far. I think one of the best moves somebody can make in their career is going to the other side of the table because it you gain so much knowledge and experience being on one side and then you go to the other side, you know what your prospective clients are looking at, you know how they're thinking. And one of the biggest insights, I got this big takeaway, was I went from GameStop to PRG. And uh, shout out to Jonathan Angers, uh, now at Zero Code, but he was at the Esports Stadium Arlington. I've told him uh, kind of the background of this story too, but Jonathan was pitching me a naming rights deal when I was at GameStop, and it just wasn't a fit. So we didn't move forward with a partnership, but I'm so thankful that I was respectful and courteous, even though it wasn't a fit for, for our brand at the time. Well, The next week I go to PRG and all of a sudden, uh, you know, I'm trying to rent, you know, this live event technology to teams, arenas, etc. And so I went in one week from being pitched to being the person pitching that person. And so what has really been a great reflective moment for me is thinking, okay, in the way that I treat this person in this moment, if our roles are reversed tomorrow and I need something from them versus them needing something from me, are they picking up the phone? Are they responding to my email? Have you had that experience? Uh, To varying degrees. Absolutely. Um, You know, when I was at premier, I actually toured the uh, esports stadium in Arlington uh, with Jonathan. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So yeah. Love that dude. Shout out. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Um, and because uh, I was trying to get them on to do some strategic consulting and valuation for the naming rights, sure. right? That you were being pitched at the same time. So <laughs> full um, circle, yeah, 
right? Yeah. And then now, I mean, technically he and I are competitors now, right? But uh, it's, you know, that's how closely knit the general entertainment industry is. Um, I mean, we've got people on the sports and live team that um, and sort of the way we're structured where everybody sits on their respective accounts, of course, but mm-hmm. we also have people with their area of expertise, minds gaming and esports. And we have a guy who used to work at WME, uh, the talent agency. Yeah. So anytime there's talent implications for a sponsorship or partnership that we're discussing on behalf of the client, he'll get brought in to offer that expertise. And like he had, you know, we were talking for, you know, WME's got the pretty impressive roster of gaming and, you know, digital creator talent. Right. Sure. So we'll have conversations with them frequently. And he had, you know, not only like gone to high school with the people, people we were talking to, but it also worked with them and at, as they were both at WME. So it is a very small world and didn't just, you know, treating people the way you want to be treated, such a cliche, but yeah, you know, being able to at least be respectful when yeah. you're declining opportunities um, or being respectful when the opportunities get declined to you as sure. well. Right. So um, it's, it's how you handle yourself in the face of adversity one way or another, I think can be really telling of whether you'd even want to work with that person again. Right. Uh, so time. yeah. And yeah. And so I totally agree with you. Yeah, uh, what you're talking about here is this tight community and essentially a close network. And actually, uh, the person who introduced you to me to join me as a guest on the podcast is our good friend John Younger. Um, He's one of the best people in my experience in developing relationships just by being a great person. Uh, he's come over to my house to lose at billiards a number of times. <laughs> a little... <laughs> shade thrown there uh but you know talk a little bit about how you have effectively developed a network and how that network has contributed to your success in this space i I think a lot of it's about giving without expectation Mm -hmm. and offering and i think it's john younger's phrase but it's people helping people helping people yep right and that that one to come out yeah Right. Yeah. And I, that really resonates because, you know, I'm sure like you, you, we get LinkedIn requests because we work in this cool upcoming industry that so many people want to be a part of. Right. Yeah. And so being able to offer 15 to 30 minutes to talk on the phone with somebody that has questions about it, whether it's a college student or someone that is in the traditional sports world that is like, Hey, I saw you, we have similar backgrounds. We'd love to understand one, how you got into this and two, how you're enjoying it. And if you think it's worth it. Right. Right. Um, and then just being able to help people out one, one way or another, depending, it doesn't matter what side of the business that you're on because probably 99% likely you're going to cross paths with them again, because Mm -hmm. especially in the gaming world, because it is very, very tight knit and you're right. The bad actors, as you'll see on Twitter, Every week, it seems sometimes, uh, you know, shout out to Jake Lucky for, uh, you know, uh, promoting uh, those uh, bad actors, right? And, the, and sure. their behaviors, but, you know, they'll, they'll be found out and yeah. or like they'll maybe still be in a position, but um, people, p- people know. Word right? travels so fast. being able to right? help people yeah. and, and develop that. But I think it also comes down to like doing good work too and being able to execute good point. and deliver when you're required to. Right. And so I think that's the only, not the only reason, right. But one of the big reasons I got my role at premier partnerships, which has now led me into this situation was I reached out to the former CEO of the minor league hockey team that I was working at at the time. And I was like, Hey, you know, I see you're connected with Randy Bernstein, uh, who was the co-founder and CEO of premier. And I was like, they have this open position. I've been trying to get in the door, his assistant who I'm friendly with now, Kevin, but, uh, uh, cause we work together, but he's like, he's, you know, kicking me down the road until they hire this other role. So I just asked, like, Hey, do you mind like asking him if I can just get on the phone with him? Yeah. Right. No expectations. Like, look, and he, and he had said, haven't talked to the guy in a while. 
not really sure what will happen, but I think giving without expectation and just being able to help people and having proven yourself, not that you have to be worthy for receiving help, but, Mm -hmm. you know, respect is earned at the end of the day. And there's various ways to earn that. Uh, In this case, it was, I sold a lot of season tickets and then was able to, you know, basically earn that respect and trust of, uh, person in the industry in the sports industry that had a lot of connections and helped me get to where I am today. But I, yeah. I also think it's, it's important to have people to talk to that aren't directly related to your business so that you can riff on stuff and sort of mm. talk things out with people. And I know that's something me and John Younger will do fairly frequently where we'll, you know, metaverse is a big buzzword right now sure. so we're we'll riff on that for like an hour on the phone just like after hours give each other a call and be like what's going on with this thing is it is it even real right now should we even like want to focus on it obviously we want to understand it and get ahead of the game and understand right. really what those opportunities are definitely at wave maker you know we've got a metaverse task force if you will yeah. that you know we're looking to develop that point of view for our clients as to what they should and shouldn't do in the space. Right. But being able to talk that out with someone that, you know, isn't going to like, it's not going to have an impact on your day to day. It's just a good way to speak your mind and help develop that network and just connect with people without expectation. Yeah. In fact, I have a great uh, contact for you. I will, I will share after this recording for metaverse that uh, will be great for you developing that POV. Uh, so what I'm hearing from you is essentially be generous with your time and be great at what you do. And the way I see it is it's don't ask people to do things that you're not willing to do yourself. And so if you expect somebody else to be generous with their time, how can you ask that if you yourself are not generous with your time? Right. Exactly. Um, it's, it's a give and take in everything that you do. Yeah. Right. Uh, there, it's theory of uh, what most object in motion. Or there's some Aristotle theory of relativity type metaphor that's escaping me right now. But there's I'm sure it's relevant a, to the conversation. Very relevant. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, and then at the same time, like, yeah, you can be a nice guy and that's important. But also you need to be great at what you do. You need to be able to execute uh, when it comes down to it. I do want to shift the conversation over to esports specifically. So uh, you've shared about how your network enabled you to go from one thing to another. If you are speaking to people who are trying to get into esports, whether it's a young person or whether it's somebody who is more seasoned but looking to get in this industry and pivot from uh, their past role, what is your advice to them? Um, You know, my experience has been sort of on this you know, networking topic of like, talk to people, get to know people, do good work. Yeah. And those opportunities will, you know, you hope will present themselves in one way, shape or form. Um, with esports specifically, you know, and I, even in like the sports industry before, like you don't need a sport management degree to be good in the sports industry. Right. Okay. Like, do you want to work at a professional hockey team or a professional football team, a sports management degree? Well, like, okay, yeah, it's a degree, but I majored in journalism at the university of Texas and that, and now I work in marketing, right? So right. And I was working in sales before that, which is a far cry from journalism. Right. But I think you can apply those skills effectively. Yep. And, you know, I was able to take the classes that were able to educate me and on critical thinking more or less is what helps really drive your success sometimes especially I agree in that. a yeah. world that's super foreign to a lot of people and being able to communicate that in a palatable way right yeah. so breaking into the esports industry you have a job get a job don't be dead set on oh i want to work for team liquid i want to work for complexity right get your foot in the door where you can yeah, exactly. Right. If you want to be a social media manager for a professional esports team, yeah, you'll have to have endemic gaming knowledge, but you're not going to get hired because you love Overwatch or because you love Call of Duty. Good point. Right. You're going to have to be able to communicate your value 
in other ways that are actually going to impact the business. Right. Yes. And without any experience, it doesn't have to be professional experience. If you're in college and you, there's an esports club at your team or, or just any club sports team that you can be a social media manager for, for free, it's experience that you can show in a portfolio or on a resume um, that's going to help you stand out uh, because there's so many people knocking on the door of this industry yeah. trying to figure out a way in. And, you know, there could be opportunities where you come in as like, say you have a finance degree, but you really want to, but you, you think you'd be a great counter-strike coach. Uh-huh. Yeah. You could get in as like an accountant for a team, but if you're good at it, you, is there going to be that opportunity that really develops you? Is it a foot in the door sure. in the wrong role for you? Like that's a personal decision you'd have to make. Um, I think being able to show your value in any way, shape or form though, is going to be the most crucial aspect to finding a spot in this very small industry. Yeah, I can relate to that um, outside of the esports industry that um, when I was at a point in my career where I was looking to get into the marketing and advertising industry, where I, that's what I got my degree in in college, I used my experience as a producer f- with uh, animation, graphic design, live action to get into a marketing agency in their content studio. And once I was in that content studio... I started talking to everybody about, like, hey, I'm, I'm trying to do some marketing around here. Um, to relate directly to esports, I always give the advice, and I'm curious if you ad- agree or would add to it, is volunteer. And so my perspective is everything in business is based on relationships, and people hire the people they know, right? So uh, it's much more likely that if you're looking at a list of candidates, you're going to lean towards somebody you know, uh, you've got a friendship with them, you know what their temperament is, you've worked with them before, rather than uh, some job just, or, you know, some resume on a page saying, oh yeah, 10 years in the industry, you have XYZ experience, because it all comes down to who the person is. In, In my estimation, the best way to build those relationships, if you don't have them yet, is to volunteer, to just go to an event like I'm here in Dallas. So uh, Envy Gaming is one of the bigger uh, teams here in Dallas. If they're throwing a uh, event, like they just had the CDL event at Esports Stadium Arlington, contact the team, contact uh, Corey Dunn, something like that and say, hey, I know you're doing this event. I would like to volunteer and help in any way that you need it. And don't, don't say, I want to run the cameras. I, can I run your social media? Just say, however you need help, can I do it for you? And you're going to gain experience, you're going to gain relationships, and then you're going to be able to then take the next step and follow up. People are going to experience, wow, this is this is a really giving person. This guy works hard. He showed up on time. You know, Those are the things at the lower level positions that really get you going. And then find that expertise and build that experience from there. Would you agree yeah, add to I- that? I, I'd agree with the caveat that like definitely know your value too, though. And like, don't do work for free because you have to, right? Sure, good point. Like, you know, like, cause that can, you can be exploited and yeah. you'd hope that, uh, you know, the more reputable teams out there wouldn't, that you would be compensated in, sure. in some way. Um, but yeah, volunteering to uh, a great example of this, when I was a senior in college, we had the opportunity to do uh, basically work on the PR team for a Ferrari racing team mm-hmm. uh, at Circuit of the Americas, which is the track in Austin uh, yeah. where they hold the F1 race. This was for a Le Mans race. This was not F1, unfortunately, but um, big drive to survive guy now, basing my whole personality off of F1. Can't wait for the rest of the season to keep going. But nice. I digress. Had the opportunity to work to sacrifice one of my weekends, which when you're a senior in college and living in Austin can be a difficult thing to stomach because there's a lot going on in that city. Right. Sure. And, um, but was able to create a relationship with Don Pierce, um, who was you know, in charge of communications for this team. And he's another one of those people that I can call up and we can riff 
about various things. Yeah. Um, and, and he's incredible. He's, you know, I think he's in his seventies now and he's like going to law school because he just wants to keep learning and, and yeah. Wow. Awesome dude. Right. But th- that relationship was born out of a volunteer opportunity mm-hmm. that I, and I had no idea what Le Mans racing even was until that Friday evening sure. we were doing, getting our media credentials. Right. So, uh, I totally agree. And, you know, that's one of those opportunities where I think you can ignore that caveat of being paid for services. Right. Um, obviously I was a college student at the time too, and there was less social pressure on businesses to compensate interns at yeah. that time. Um, but no, yeah, I, I would agree with you mostly. Yeah, it's you did make an important part, point with that caveat of you know, I, you know, making sure that you hold your value. Uh, Arda Ocal, who's a host on ESPN, was on this show, right. and one thing that he shared was set expectations early on. Hey, what is my path to get a job with you? Like, what do I have to do? Like, I'm here to volunteer today, but. I will volunteer here today. If I want to work for you, what do I need to accomplish? And when they give you that feedback, if they give you that feedback, then you have something to essentially hold them accountable in a way. And you have a roadmap to accomplish that. And because they have already said, okay, we will be in a position to hire you if you do X, Y, Z. Then you come back and you say, hey, I did X, Y, Z. You're setting yourself up in a great position. You're no longer being taken advantage of. And you've also shown that you are somebody who follows through in the things that they uh, aim to accomplish. Yeah, I know. It's, it's a great strategy because it shows you listen to and you can execute, which we talked about earlier, is a great way to be able to get to where you want to go. You're exactly right. So one thing I want to uh, dive into here with you is how different esports orgs approach this space. Uh, you're somebody who, you know, you worked for Immortals. Uh, they have a little bit of a different perspective on the space or an approach than Evil Geniuses. Uh, I think this is a topic that a lot of people don't understand. Uh, a lot of people view esports as like just one thing rather than 20 plus competitive titles with different uh, uh, different audiences, different demographics, etc. We don't need to go all the way into that. But I think it's important for people to understand if I want to, let's say, engage the esports space as a brand, there are differences being between these teams greater than just the number of followers that they have on Twitter. Um, and a lot of times when you see these teams pitched, it's I'm FaZe, I'm 100 Thieves, and shout out to them for gaining those audiences. It's incredible, but they have a perspective and they have an approach. EG has an approach, Misfits has an approach, Envy has an approach, and they're very different. How can you uh, share from your experience pitching these teams how you approached it very differently? Yeah, I mean, with Immortals especially, they have, uh, you know, at the time they had four different brands underneath the holding company that were Immortals, um, their you know, League of Legends, and well, wasn't quite League of Legends yet, became League of Legends after a merger with Infinite Esports and Entertainment. Uh, but to get overcomplicated, they yeah. had MIBR, which is a Brazilian Counter Strike brand. Mm-hmm. Um, they had the LA Valiant in Overwatch League. And then had Optic Gaming Los Angeles in Call of Duty League at that time. And one thing right. to preface too, before you get too deep into it for the audience, is <laughs> to share that uh, I always like to use this analogy with the structure of esports organizations because it's a little confusing. Is the same as a collegiate uh, sports structure. So you went to University of Texas. I went to Sacramento State. Uh, shout out Hornets. Stingers up. That's what we do. You guys do this. We do this. Yeah, we've we got the hook'em Hornets. Yeah. So uh, it takes less effort to just do the pinky, you know? Well, it's very regal. I try, you know, when I'm sipping the champagne, you know, I'm going pinky yeah. up. Uh, <laughs> um, so the structure is similar to, to collegiate sports where you have University of Texas and they have a football team, a baseball team, a basketball team, etc. Immortals in this uh, example would have let's say a Call of Duty team, you have a Counter-Strike team, you have a League of Legends team, etc. Correct? Right. Um, well, and that's really where Immortals differentiated from a lot of the 
competitive structures that you'll see out there. So Evil Genius is much more in line with that collegiate uh, athletics structure. Okay. One team name, you play multiple sports, mm-hmm. right? Um, and where Immortals differed was they had multiple team names to play within different titles. So Immortals was mm. the League of Legends brand yeah. and still is. And they also have a Wild Rift team. Uh, I believe they have a Valorant team as well, right? And those are all Riot Games titles. Mm-hmm. And so the crossover of fandom, especially with like League of Legends and Wild Rift, where they're essentially the same game. Mobile versus mobile BC, and, essentially. Yeah, exactly, yeah. right? And then MIBR is its own unique animal because it's very Brazil focused. Mm-hmm. But that aside, they compete in Valorant, uh, women's Valorant, in Counter Strike, Counter Strike, and Rainbow Six. Yeah. So that's a that's their first person shooter uh, brand essentially. Sure. Optic Gaming was going to be the like Call of Duty community. Uh, when they owned that at the time, right? And then LA Valiant is the Overwatch team. Um, And so that's a super interesting strategy to me because, as you know, like you said, esports is like saying just sports, right? The nuances between these audiences are pretty drastic, right? Mm -hmm. Like Dota 2 fans are very, very dissimilar to Call of Duty fans yes. who are not that much alike to League of Legends fans, right. right? So it can be difficult, and you'll see a lot of these uh, organizations out there, the top of mind is Team Liquid, where they have their main Team Liquid YouTube channel, mm-hmm. and then they have specific channels for each title, Team Liquid CSGO, Team Liquid Guild, their uh, World of Warcraft uh, team. And because the engagement you lose out on the engagement yeah team liquid parent twitter account however many hundreds thousands millions of followers sure but when you're posting content that's specific to one title people that aren't really fans of that title are going to tune out and you're going to lose out on that engagement yeah so immortals was essentially hedging against that where like each individual team brand immortals mibr la valiant had smaller followings than a lot of their competitors, but their engagement was higher because it was focused on those fans of those titles, right? So, yeah, it was it was a yeah, putting my partnership hat on here too. Is what I would think if I was at Immortals at that time is okay. We have these separate brands. I I can now unlock separate brand categories for each of these potentially. So, was that something that they looked into, or or was that problematic to say? Let's just say headsets. Uh, Turtle Beach is sponsoring MIBR, and then you got uh, HyperX, just for pure example, is sponsoring the Immortals League of Legends team. Was that something that could happen, or was were there issues with trying to do that? Uh, it, it depended on the category, really. You know, mm-hmm. like when you're you're dealing with a console team like Optic, and then you're dealing with a PC focused brand like Immortals, right? Like, you know, Turtle Beach, for example at the time, wasn't going to sponsor a League of Legends team. They were all in on console league sports, yeah, right? Cost, Stuff, yep. controllers. They got no business uh, doing a League of Legends team Good deal yeah. until Wild Rift console comes out in whenever that may happen. Sure. Um, so there were opportunities too, but I think one of the bigger benefits of segmenting those was brand safety issues a lot of brands have some hesitancy to enter first person shooter titles true so you can still get a deal done with them with your more brand safe titles like league of legends or overwatch which is more like fantasy cartoon violence um compared to call of duty or counter-strike which is quite realistic right and you know it it was a way to help segment those categories where yeah you could have but like if somebody's gonna be like a naming rights partner of a training center or something like that it's going to show up in all the content from every team that's true doing work there so there were nuances to that strategy but yeah it, it was an opportunity for them to you know maximize your, your categories um and, and brand partnerships yeah and then 
I'm not sure if this happened while you were at EG, but they had a pretty strong collegiate focus or um, kind of a pipeline focus. Uh, talk a little about that because that's another piece of it where, you know, we're talking top tier esports previously, but this is a very diverse ecosystem where you have collegiate, you have content creators, et cetera. Uh, what's that lower amateur collegiate tier like? Yeah. Um, yeah, they've, they founded the Genius League, um, I believe, in like late 2020. Okay. Um, as a way to engage the collegiate demographic with brand ambassadors, the same way you'd see like Monster Energy or Red Bull mm -hmm. uh, brand ambassadors driving the car around. They park outside the library during finals week because everybody needs caffeine. Yep. Um, sometimes wish I had one that just came down my block, you know, <laughs> once or twice a week. But, uh, uh, that was a way to engage that untapped audience in which, you know, the collegiate esports ecosystem is so fragmented because yes. there's not like one governing body. I think that's like starting to good. consolidate. Nay, yeah, Star yeah, League there, and all this. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and there's organizations out there that are showing themselves to be, you know, a tier above some of these other organizers out there. Sure. Right. Um, but yeah, it's, it's interesting to just see how each team, you know, obviously I have personal experience with Immortals and Evil Geniuses, right? Where, you know, they, if Evil Geniuses is very big on like, we are developing North American talent from the amateur level into professional League of Legends players, yeah. right? That is like a North Star for them, okay? right? Immortals is developing individual communities based on the title, right? You mentioned 100 Thieves and FaZe Clan, very much like gaming lifestyle organizations that have esports teams. Right. Their bread and butter isn't necessarily the top tier esports teams, although I'd say 100 Thieves is doing quite well at balancing both right now. Yeah, you see um, FaZe with COD, Atlanta FaZe as well. So, yeah. Yeah, they're still legit. Exactly. It's not like they've got some teams nobody's ever heard of while they're focused on lifestyle. But if you're just looking at Instagram, you're you know, you're going to see more of the lifestyle stuff than the competitive stuff. Exactly. I mean, even like Face Clan's YouTube channel, I think probably like two or three of the past 10 videos are actually gaming related. The rest is just sort of like lifestyle content that you'd see from, you know, a TikToker or a non-gaming YouTuber, right? So yeah. there, there's a lot of ways to engage with the gaming, esports and gaming adjacent audience. Um, you know, there's no one path to victory here. And I think when you compare it to the traditional sports world, and this is excluding the Activision, Blizzard, Overwatch League, and Call of Duty League that are regionally franchised, where mm -hmm. you've got a city name attached to a um, uh, team. Yeah. They're, by and large, it's a very global industry. Yes. So earning that fandom is it can be a challenge for these teams because what do you have to base it on right and then there's some teams that will predicate their brand and brand voice around like competitive success right, right. like hey we are always like one of the best teams you think about some of these like top counter-strike teams like mm -hmm. you know astralis or team vitality and, and things like that right um and then there's others that are like we're we have really sick merch yeah right and, and so there's different ways to earn that fandom. And I actually had a conversation with uh, Steve, our hands at, at team liquid, uh -huh. um, you know, our client Coinbase works with them and we managed that deal. And, you know, we were having a dinner one night when we were doing a big planning summit for how this partnership is going to materialize. And it asked them, I was like, Hey, so what's next for esports teams? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, which is like such a, like, broad question and there's no right answer and he was like i'm gonna have to think about that <laughs> let me eat a couple more pieces of sushi here but you know like that would and he had said how like yeah it can be difficult to like earn that intellectual like the, that passion from fans mm -hmm. that's not predicated on competitive success or on a specific personality because both of those things can be temporary. Yeah, right? that personality, that that player, in fact, the consumer behavior is typically they follow players over teams. And so, you know, a player, if they don't like the team they're with, they're like, all right, 
I'm going to take my 2 million followers with me somewhere else and they're not sticking with you. They're coming with me. And that's a big bo- that's why I'm a big believer in the the North American franchise sports. I, I sh- well, I should say the Activision Blizzard franchise esports because they are uh they do have international teams even though they tend to play and live in Los Angeles or New York or Dallas. Mm-hmm. But to dig into that piece a little bit, this is something that was a huge eye-opener for me when I was at GameStop that really uh, increased my appreciation for these leagues. And that was the understanding that esports being so global without any geographic ties to cities a few years ago, if you were not a global brand, you didn't have a play in esports yet. And the thing that opened my mind was I saw the announcement of HEB the local grocery store in Houston sponsoring the Outlaws. And I didn't know anything about HEB at the time. And so when I saw the announcement, I was like, oh, this is going to be brutal. They're going to get destroyed. A grocery store sponsoring an esports team. This is just going to be, you know, blood in the water for these sharks on Twitter and Reddit, right? I was completely wrong, to be fair. People love HEB. And they do sell like some headsets and they do sell some controllers a little bit and stuff like that. But the fact that HEB now had a play in esports because they were a local brand and there was a local team unlocks so many companies that are either local or just North America or maybe just, you know, Paris or UK, whatever, right? Is you now have this opportunity to engage in the space where previously you did not. Yeah, it, it is that opportunity to get that regionally focused, which across most esports, when we say regionally focused, it's North America yeah. or it's Brazil or yeah. it's you know yeah. Europe or APAC, right? It's yeah. it's not a necessarily a specific country with you know a few exceptions here and there, right? Um, and I think yeah, I, I think the the challenge I know when I was on and trying to sell sponsorships against the regionalized teams was managing those expectations. Cause it's a lot smaller actually looks like because so yeah. many marketers will see these big numbers. Esports is bigger than the super bowl. It's like, okay, well that's like saying like premier league and major league baseball and, you know, MLS and the NHL and the NBA are bigger than the Super Bowl, right? right. It's, it's, I saw the okay, latest so New Zoo doing... statistic. There's, you know, what, 600 million esports enthusiasts, and I want to reach all of them, and I heard that if I sponsor your team, it's going to happen. It's like, no, actually the DMA uh, for the uh, Miami Mayhem is going to just be kind of Florida. So um, and that's going to be X amount versus, yeah. Yeah, and then they see the pictures of, like, Oracle Arena being sold out for the League of Legends World Championship, right? Uh-huh. And we're like, well, yeah, so our Overwatch League home stand is going to have like 2,400 to 5,000 people at it, right? That is quite different than an arena that's sold out for three days in a row with 20,000 people in it. Um, but it's definitely more affordable than that opportunity, let me tell you, right? So yeah, like, well- there, there's a lot of places for brands to play. Um, it's just finding out like what your strategy is and coming in in a you know, additive way, not an ad as an adver- advertiser. Yeah, I would definitely say um, the thing to take away from this is regardless of your brand, your industry, your positioning, there's a play for you within esports to reach this group. Just do your homework and talk to a number of different teams, leagues, etc. And last point on the regional teams, I'm a big believer on a, a, a crawl, walk, run strategy where you do a little bit uh, you learn, you pivot a little bit, and then you scale it, and then you like really blow it out of the water. And one thing I really love about these uh, franchise teams is, yeah, it's a smaller audience, but you can get the crawl and the walk down before you are ready to run with your brand and really hit the accelerator. Uh, curious to you, what is either a tactic or or a, a partnership that you've seen that's very effective that others can look at that and potentially replicate? Um, 
I, this is like 1000 percent biased um yeah. but as the deal that i are, did yeah yes, yeah <laughs> of course no, no. but i i think it, it it can be applied other ways too right but uh-huh. you know coinbase is a major sponsor of team liquid and as part of that we are the title ish presenting sponsor of the coin box which is a weekly super smash tournament hosted by hungry box very prominent super smash creator okay. right and the way we we coinbase came in there is in an additive way we were contributing and supporting this community yeah without asking for anything in return at least right away um so there are kpis we'd like to hit of course but yeah so when we announced hey there, like there were with the context of there weren't going to be any LAN events uh, until like, very recently uh-huh. for the Super Smash community, right? Which is like very passionate. It's like a very, very small ecosystem, but they are, they love Smash, right? So we came in and we're doubling the prize pool of this weekly online Smash tournament hosted by Hungrybox, right? And it's the largest weekly prize pool in that community. Mm-hmm. We had all the fans in Twitch chat when it was announced saying, thank you, Coinbase, right? I think that's, that's hard to justify to a CMO or a CEO to be like, look, Affinity, look what right. we did. It's Everyone the, was thanking us. The softer metrics, right? Mm-hmm. Right, yeah. Like, I mean, that's a win in this space because I think it was um, Vinny from Zero Code. Uh, who He's my favorite. On, oh, uh, I love Vinny Minicello. <laughs> He's one of my faves. We yeah. just had him on the podcast, yeah. Yeah, he, you know, he talks about like, yeah, coming in and, you want the community to love you. So like, that's an example of coming in in a way that is meaningful for the audience so that you earn their trust. That's right. right? They show that you as a brand understand the audience, the gaming lifestyle, and that that can materialize in, you know, a million different ways because that's one of the cool things about this space is there's not a lot of guardrails Yes. When it comes to the things you can do as a brand in the space, like you don't even have to sponsor a team. You could just do your own thing. I mean, sure. there's so many white label tournament providers out there. You could run your own you know, league effectively if you really wanted to and wanted to commit the, the resources to it. Um, so I, I'd say that's an example of a way that a brand has come in and made an impact with a community that is going to pay dividends figure of speech um and potentially literally um, <laughs> hopefully not yeah. always only as figure yeah. of speech long term yeah. yeah i hear yeah you. right uh, um th- that's going to pay dividends for them down the road when they do ask um the audience for their business right, right. i think you know gary v very polarizing figure in yep. business and marketing strategy right but his jab jab left hook strategy right i believe it's three jabs joe there's three jabs Uh, and then there's and it's a right hook depending on if you're are you left-handed or right-handed that would make a difference i so i shoot hockey left-handed but i throw right-handed so i'm I'm confused i'm all jacked okay yes yeah confused person um but um i think that that resonates with this community too right (laughs) yeah hey here we are hey we get you and then later on you're like hey you guys should download coinbase wallet and um, store your cryptocurrency and NFTs on it. Yeah, right? it's it's not going to the community right away and having the ask. It's going and saying how can how can I make your experiences better, the experiences that you mm-hmm. care about. And I'm a big believer in my consulting at DLC. Uh, wh- when I always talk to a brand, I say, look, the experiences of the community have to be better than before your brand was involved. And so if that's not the case, if you're just saying, we want to be in esports because we want to sell a bunch of stuff, you just have not developed a strategy that's going to work just to be plain about it. And so I think step one is understanding what the community wants. And here's the greatest thing. If you ask them, they will tell you. Just be humble enough to find groups of people who are your target audience, make up your target audience, and ask them what you want, and then give it to them. And then figure out how to turn affinity into sales. Uh, And then the other thing, you know, what what was interesting I thought about your answer is I said, what is a, 
you know, a partnership that's successful and you gave me something that is successful based on softer metrics rather than, and this is how many sales. And I think that's another lesson for the audience here. If you're a brand or you're a partnership person, uh, make sure those expectations are set for what you're going to accomplish. Because if I was saying, oh, I'm so excited, I'm going to get all these sales or I'm going to get all these people this to get into this wallet like day one, I would be disappointed with affinity, right? But if I understand that you have to be known and then you have to be loved and then you, you know, are going to gain those yeah. harder KPIs, those harder metrics like sales, then I'm saying, okay, great. We have accomplished step one or we are well darn our way. These people are loving us and now they're more open to the service or the product that we provide that, that we would like them to purchase. Exactly. Yeah. It's a long runway where, you know, so, and some brands like, you know, I think a lot of times the automotive brands, right. They got money to blow. They can come in in a big way Yeah, and they don't necessarily have to ask people to buy their cars. You know, if you live in LA, you're going to need a car. Sometimes it's recency bias. Sometimes it's that affinity play, right. There's yeah. not necessarily a strict conversion tracking in which like esports, I don't think is a strong conversion focused play. And that was something we always had to, tell brands that we were talking to on the sales side it was like look we're not going to beat your your customer acquisition costs we're not going to beat your cpm that you're getting on the likes of facebook instagram google sure. like you, we're not that type of marketing solution mm -hmm. right and i think sometimes there is that disconnect for those unfamiliar with the space because it's so digitally focused they think that yeah, you can just attach a pixel to anything and it's a click-through rate and it's this and that and it's like no, 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 let's, let's back it up. It, there are opportunities like that. Yeah. You can spend with media platforms that will offer those more measurable, trackable opportunities, um, where you're going to see what that conversion is. But if you're sponsoring an esports team, it's not going to be a conversion play. And I've learned this yeah. the hard way when we have done deals that were conversion focused and they completely flopped. Yeah. And then, you know, another part of thinking about this is as far as your marketing mix, you know, it doesn't have to completely be esports. Esports can be the affinity and the awareness piece of your marketing mix that then you're having other pieces uh, be that conversion. So I think connecting with somebody like yourself uh, who really knows this space extremely well and can help you navigate, okay, what are the games? Who are the players? Where can I get in? And also, what are the things I should be seeking to accomplish here? And what are the things I should not be seeking to accomplish here? That if I know that, I'm saying, okay, the other place that places that my brand is playing in, I'm going to try to build off this affinity with esports to then have that result in conversion, maybe targeting mom, right? Because you got the kids all hyped on, oh, I love Coinbase. They support my thing. Well, then conversion let's say mom is making the purchase for this uh, say the example, you're then targeting her where you normally would target a mother and then you've got a better, uh, more robust marketing strategy. Right, yeah, leverage the IP that you get as from your strategic partnerships so you can use Evil Geniuses, Team Liquid, Phase Clan IP in your media and you, know, you can run that on ESPN whole family is watching the local sports team play, right? My kids be the LA Kings. Mm -hmm. And then the kids see, oh, here's this commercial. It's this Coinbase commercial. It's got Team Liquid stuff. I love Team Liquid. The parents see that. And they're like, oh, yeah, maybe we should look into this whole cryptocurrency thing. Because 14-year-olds right. you know, aren't exactly the target demo for a cryptocurrency exchange, um, both pragmatically and legally, right? <laughs> so it's uh, Just as important uh, or more. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, you know, that, that is, that's part of how those strategies can materialize. You talk about the marketing mix. It's not a one size fits all. It's the same way you'd approach any other marketing relationship. If you're going to pay, you know, Mila Kunis, Jim Beam to be in your ads, yeah. right? Like you're, that's an endorsement deal. And then you're also buying the media where those ads will materialize right, right? Uh, you know and brands do this all the time and sometimes i think it's that that educational hurdle where you know we have a esports 101 deck internally that we'll use for like landscape overviews and i have a slide in it that says don't be scared you've done this before and mm. just puts side by side right at tottenham hotspur jersey next to some other esports team jersey that 
to the untrained eye look exactly the same. Like they, they could just be another soccer team. Right. Right. And it's the Louis Vuitton, uh, trophy case. Yeah. Such a sick integration. Yeah. The NBA and league of legends worlds, right. Mm -hmm. They do the exact same thing and, or a caster desk with state farm for overwatch or it's for, the NBA, right? So but Joe, they, but Joe, I don't understand why people watch other people play video games. This is crazy. Yeah, right. So yeah, it's 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 sometimes it's it's hand holding and just being saying yeah. like, hey, look, Nick, you you understand and like use that collegiate sports yep. analogy all the time, right? Um, yeah, to help folks grasp that uh, because it, it can be so nuanced depending on the titles that you're looking to explore. And obviously, you know, we try to help our clients with those strategic insights to navigate which communities they should play in because like, Oh, yeah. we really want to reach the Hispanic demographic. Well, call of duty index is high for Hispanic audiences Boom. Um, for esports viewership. Right. So that's a path forward that we can look at. Right. That's not the only demographic they're trying to hit, but that that's definitely a box we'd like to check. So um, that's, how we really try to, you know, but both when I was on e on either side of the table, you know, it's yeah. about educating big time folks on this very seemingly abstract world of professional video games and paring that down into whether it's metaphors, analogies, or just like simple text that yeah. can help drive a huge impact for their brand, uh, especially on those softer metrics like affinity and consideration and, you know, intent to purchase. Sure. Um, but yeah, so, I mean, that's, I, we've kind of like, I forget what the original question was, or, but you know, we've kind of, me too. You know, touched a lot in the last <laughs> five minutes. Yeah. No, I think it's awesome. What I'm getting from you is essentially uh, if you're going to be successful in this space, if you're a brand, especially somebody who doesn't have experience in gaming, it's connected with somebody like yourself who can uh, sit you down and help you make sense of the space. Also have an open mind um, as to, you know, this, this space is not quite as foreign as it may appear on the surface, but also mm -hmm. an open mind as to what I'm going to achieve in this space and also how important it is to achieve those things long term with this young demographic that is fiercely loyal to the brands that enhance the experiences that are meaningful to them. Exactly. Cool. Well, we have uh, rounded out this episode. It's been a blast. Time flies when you're having fun. What are the ways that people can follow you or get a hold of Waymaker, Wavemaker in the way you'd like them to? Uh, LinkedIn, definitely the best. Um, Joe McMahon at Wavemaker. Um, LinkedIn.com slash user slash Joe McMahon IV. Um, there we if, go. I think that's I think that's how the URL works to find a specific user. But uh, uh, we can also link it in the description, right? Course, um, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, that, that'd be the best way to get a hold of me. Um, apologies if I don't respond right away. Uh, I try to get to it though. You're executing it's, these partnerships. You're getting these deals done. You're not on LinkedIn all day. Come on. Yeah. If you're reaching out on LinkedIn, though, yeah, this is back to the how do you get a job in esports, right? How do you grow your network? Yeah. Message someone when you connect with them on LinkedIn because if there's just blank there, it's like, well, what do you have to offer, right? That's I, right. Or what are you asking for? Because what you're asking for could be relevant to me. Uh, I, you know, you never know, but how am I supposed to know? And, well, and you end up just with a million connections that you don't actually know. And what I would say, too, is when you send somebody that invitation and you have that message, share how you can potentially benefit them. Or if what you're offering can be a benefit to them, don't ask them for stuff right away because it's going to be far less effective. But that's a whole nother yeah. podcast episode to go in on. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> for part two. Cool. Well, thank you, my friend, uh, Joe McMahon of Wavemaker, esports expert, joining us today on the DLC Drop podcast. Thank you for being here. Thank you, John. A pleasure. Thank you for listening to the DLC Drop podcast. This podcast is part of the Esports Futuri podcast network and produced by Innovation Media Enterprises. Make sure you subscribe on your favorite podcast channel and leave us a review. 